that that poem. Um, earlier this year, back in March, I spent some weeks in a rehab hospital after having undergone hip surgery. There had been some complications um, and I ended up having two operations in one week. So one of the things that kept me going during my recovery was a sense of gratitude. So I would like to start this evening by just saying, expressing my thanks to all of you for being here. And a big thank you to Ed and to Nondwe and the Red Wheelbarrow team for inviting me here tonight. Um, I'm particularly grateful also to see my daughters have tuned in. Um, my daughters uh, V and Natalia in Brussels and my other daughter Amy in at an artist residency in Finland. I think it's her last evening there and here she is. Um, so I'm very grateful and thank you to friends and family. And I see somebody who I was at school with many years ago in Brazil, Gloria. <laughs> um, so lovely to see people here. Um, thank you, thank you. I am very grateful. So um, one of the other survival techniques that helped get me through was um, breathing or simply focusing on my breath. And poetry is breath. But um, before I read my own poetry, I would like to start off with something written by late American poet, novelist, and essayist, Jim Harrison. It's titled, Why I Write. To answer this question has put me into a sump, a well pit, a quandary I haven't visited in years. Here are a number of answers. My love of life is tentative, so I write to ensure my survival. I try to write well, so I won't be caught shitting out of my mouth like a politician. To the old banality, eat or die, I add, eat and write or die. After writing, I often read Brilat Savarhan, also cookbooks, on the toilet. Then I try to cook as well as I hope I write. After a nap, I write again in the manner of an earth diver swimming in the soil to understand the roots and tendrils of trees. I anchor myself to these circular life processes so as not to piss away my life on nonsense. I hunt and fish because it helps my writing. Novels and poems are the creeks and rivers coming out of my brain. I continue writing in bleak times to support my wife and daughters, my dogs and cats, to buy wine, whiskey, food. I write as an act of worship to creatures, landscapes, ideas that I admire, to commemorate the dead, to create new women to love. Just now, while listening to the blizzard outside, I poured, poured a huge glass of Bordeaux. Ah, this is what I call fun. Rimbaud said, everything we are taught is false. I believed him when I was 18 and still do. Writers are mere goats who must see the world we live in, but have never discovered. I write to continue becoming an unmapped river. It suits me like my skin. I'm sure many of us here can relate to the sentiments so aptly expressed by Jim Harrison. And now onto my own words then. The poems that follow are mostly recent ones that have been written over the last two years or so. Some have been published in poetry journals like Stanzas or on the Avbob Poetry website. Some I'm still considering sending out into the world. So this reading tonight is a bit like a guinea pig's Ferris wheel. So please humor me. I'm going to now share my screen 
and hopefully I get it right this time. I hope that's visible. Yes, it is. Thank you. The only problem is I've got the, the Zoom bar in front of what I'm trying to read. Um, so just bear with me. Um, I'm trying to move that out of the way. Okay. My people. I come from people who ride wild horses, bareback while naked under a full moon. People who work the earth with rough hands, whose children roll about on tin roofs where chilies dry out. I come from people who know real hardship, live through dark times, but still see lightness. My people go skydiving and ride Harleys down the main road when they turn 80. My people throw their crutches to the wind, pick themselves up, learn to walk again. Beach treasures at dawn. A piece of bright red coral houses minuscule shells and signs of the sea. A mermaid's purse wrapped with tendrils frames a shark egg of jelly-like life. A single perlimun shell of medium size glistens the meeting of ocean and sky. A heavy, dark piece of driftwood has settled comfy on the yellow sand. A whitewashed bone, smooth and round, she believes was once a turtle's femur. Such small things have become her whole world as she imagines the stories of a strandlooper, an illiterate Pole who had jumped ship long ago near Cape Agullis, her great-grandfather. Snared. What morbid curiosity draws me back to the dense bush, to the forested entanglement of vines, beneath tightly packed Bosburburn and euphorbia trees, where a once graceful bushbuck now rests. Merely bone and dry hide, its skeletal remains stretch from branch to earth. One foreleg bone sticks straight out. Another is missing, dragged off, perhaps, by a wild dog. A monkey vine noose still holds the remains of a once delicate neck, now only deformed brown hide. And part of the twisted vine snakes between two long horns. There had been no chance of escape. And I wonder whether the animal fought frantically to get away. Did the creature cry or scream or grunt hoarsely when it suddenly faced its end? I pray it was quick. I remember. I remember the last time I saw you was when we buried Uncle Bruce in the shade of a Kameldurenboom. I remember we stopped on the side of the road neath the neon light of old Harfish's shop. I remember you balanced a whiskey bottle and three glasses on your car bonnet to honour Uncle Bruce. I remember 30 years earlier when you visited me in hospital. You brought me milkshake laced with whiskey. I remember I was high on morphine, so I shouted at you to drink the whiskey yourself. I remember designing your wedding invitations. I remember you never got married though you tried three times. I remember our student days at Witz and you were a rag princess in the first year of your aborted LLB. I remember you drove into my mini from behind by accident one day as we took the highway turn off to get to lectures on time. I remember when you read the late night financial news on TV and I could not always stay awake to watch you. I remember your activism, anti-fracking, anti-nickel, and how one journalist called you 
our own Erin Brockovich. I remember how, after your mother's funeral, you told me about the lump under your arm and how it throbbed when you were upset. I remember the pact you made with a friend that you would help each other during the end stages of your lives. I remember knowing you were going when the message arrived that someone had gone to fetch the morphine. I remember us riding in your Z3 sports car with a canopy down and the heater on full blast, just laughing. The Corona Rose. When you tested positive for COVID, the 70 kilometers between us was too great a distance while you isolated alone. To glimpse your face over a fence, through a window, behind a crack in the door was a must. I loaded my car with groceries, tissues, medications, soaps and sanitizers, a range of textures, an abundance of taste, cranberry juice, spicy chai, a loaf of freshly baked sourdough rye, homemade stone soup abundant with herbs, ginger and garlic and chili, star anise, coriander and cardamom, aromas so intense I hoped you would smell them, even if you could not taste. Out in the street, I lined up the groceries in a row across the closed driveway behind large automatic gates. At the very end, I placed a potted yellow rose. Back inside my car, I texted you on my phone. You shuffled to the gate, pajamaed, slippered, masked. I waved from behind the car windscreen. Later, over the phone, you hoarsely thanked me for the soup. You could only imagine tastes and smells when you chewed on bits of cardamom or squashed a lump of potato between tooth and tongue, your senses temporarily confused. It is several months later. You still cannot taste fresh coriander, but the yellow rose, pruned and repotted, bursts with new leaf growth and tiny buds. Swells. Today, the closed river is a series of turbulent waves. Frantic birds haphazardly sky cross as the ocean rages upwards, rushes the villagers to move their canoes offshore. My mother never wanted to live too close to a river. They come down in flood, she would say. But I have always felt at home along the edges of water. As a young girl, I was forbidden to swim in the Mariko. The baboons will chase you, my mother had said. So I skinny dipped while everyone napped after lunch when it was too hot to go out because of snakes. Now, decades later, and orphaned, I watch the river from our deck as a pair of fish eagles sing praises to the sky and the rainbird's liquid notes fill the air. Soon the river will open out to the sea. Children of the World we meet in different time zones, an hour to three away from GMT. We have done this every week. Our cross-continental catch-up chat has spanned many places over the years. Hanoi, Bali, Zanzibar, Italy, Belgium, Portugal, Riyadh, Istanbul, and more. In Brussels, Storm Eunice has wreaked havoc. In Riyadh, Dinner is not before 10. Back here, the river is shrinking, the ocean is loud, and the dogs miss you all so much. Vicariously, I listen and cling to your stories. You, whom I birthed 
decades ago. You who still teach me so much. You who make me proud to be a mother. Your voices through smartphones bring you only near enough for virtual hugs. I listen to the gaps in conversation that hold our spaces together. To-do list. This is a found poem written on a scrap of paper a few days before traveling overseas. Tuesday, 4th of July, 9.30, Pilates, 10.30, chiropractor, 11, bank, forex, 12, doctor, 12.30, lunch, 1.30, hair, 2.30, printing, e-ticket and funeral claim, 3, mom's ashes, question mark, X-rays, exclamation mark. Five, work. But halfway through the day, upon return to my car, I am locked out. A case of remote jamming scuppers my careful planning. I don't fetch mom's ashes. It's too late for my x-rays. My work will have to wait. I slump down next to the locked car to avoid the icy wind and just wail. This is another found poem after returning from overseas, um, found poem on my Google timeline. Location information, Saturday, 29th of July from Avenue de la Couronne at 11.40 a.m., driving 36 minutes, 10.2 kilometers to Brussels Airport, before flying 5,148 kilometers to Dubai. Sunday, 30th of July, from Dubai International Airport at 12.04 a.m., flying 6,414 kilometers to Johannesburg's O.R. Tambo International Airport, waiting from 11 a.m. until 3.07 p.m. before flying again, 770 kilometers to King Palo Airport, East London, then driving two hours, seven minutes, 157 kilometers to Dyer's home for the aged in Alexandria, sitting at dad's bedside until he falls asleep. Then driving 52 minutes, 60.5 kilometers to home in Seafield. Monday, 31st of July, the phone rings at 4.01 a.m. Dad has left us. Paralytic grief. You no longer care how you look in public. The same crumpled clothing from a suitcase, three days running. No mascara, no eyeliner. Tears sting and smudge your face. No lipstick. The only red you wear is around your eyes. At the hair salon, you beg a cut. After a much needed head massage, move in a daze to a swivel chair, accept a cup of tea and a biscuit. Despite the superstition of not cutting your hair after losing a parent, wrapped in a black plastic apron, you talk only about death. But as dark tresses fall to the floor, you begin to feel a little lighter. Red Earth. When a cousin threw the first shovel full of soil over your newly laid coffin, with mom's urn of ashes where the floral wreath had been, my eyes followed the dust clouds heavenwards. Nephews, other cousins and friends 
took up more spades to lift clods of red earth to fill up your grave. Despite the late winter chill, the midday sun was hot. Beads of sweat formed on brows, wet shirts clung to backs. On the green carpet that surrounded the grave, all the family dogs circled casually, as though joining in the activity, movement of life after death. As the dust cloud grew, I moved further back, strapped on the face mask I still carry in my pocket, just in case. Just in case? Just in case I happen to be in a cloud of dust at my father's funeral? Just in case I need to disguise my sniffles, absorb my tears, hide my eyes? Just in case the overwhelm has nowhere else to go? Tired cousins hand over spades to farm workers with fresh energy to carry on shoveling. A woman's voice starts singing in Setswana, adding sound to the cloud of rising dust. The many aloes freshly planted along the ancestral graveyard border will always flower in June and July when you and mom both died. The Bufani bulb I brought from the Eastern Cape, used by the Khoisan to embalm the dead, will remind me always of other realms symbolic protector of a life hereafter. Dear father, son of the Bushveld, you are now at rest with your Mariko bride, where you always wanted to be, and the dust will soon start to settle. Just an alert, these are not all about death. So before you decide to run away, there, there, there will be a change later. Um, morning coffee. Every morning before the house is awake, she opens up the little cabin where her father had stayed for a while after her mom had passed on. Greeting him, she plugs in the heater. It's cold again, dad, I'll bring some coffee shortly. The transistor radio she bought for his birthday springs to life at the flick of a switch. As she leaves the room to put on the kettle, her eyes fall on the photograph of her father smiling brightly next to her mother, his wife of nearly 70 years. Later, she returns with coffee in her hand, unplugs the heater and stares at the empty bed. Springtide. An unusual springtide, strange storm swell, battered the brass bell in Cork Bay, brought down a stone wall at Kelly's Beach, decapitated Kenton on Sea's famous carriage rock. Enormous angry waves dragged a child out to sea, killed a nonagenarian, flooded houses, dumped sandbanks. Guido's parking lot went underwater right up to the little shop where we would buy ice cream for mum and dad, then just for dad, now only for me. Stick, stock, take. Try saying that quickly, stick, stock, take. Stick, stick, stock, take. Besides a pair of metallic blue crutches, there are six walking sticks that she still uses regularly. At her bedside, what she thought was a Zulu knobkiri is a flexible iron rod wrapped with stacked leather, apparently an antique plantation cane. Outside the front door, nice stick from Hogsback, carved out of an alien wattle species from the forest is now splitting, sun-cracked, and in need of a coat of varnish. Outside her workroom, me, my stick, and I haggled over along the dusty roadside en route to the Catberg Mountains. Outside the guest cottage, a crooked length of olive wood has a strip of green leather wrapped around its handle, 
a shillelagh from a farmer's market in Bedford. In the boot of her car, an ultralight trekking pole, a gift from her daughters to go hiking again after recovering from surgery. Inside the car, behind the driver's seat, a fold-up black light metal rod with hook handle, essential for any overseas trip. But there are two more canes she can now use that rest in the umbrella tray of an ancient hall stand, her mother's blue one and her father's black. Neighbours. Unexpectedly, I encounter our new neighbour beneath the vast canopy of leaves and trees that intertwine haphazardly skywards. We walk over crackling thicket between vines and branches, roughly slashed by a team he had called together only days earlier. He wonders, how far can he still cut? Asks me, where is the border between our properties? Thinks aloud whether he can clear trees closer to the river. When I remind him there are limits, there are boundaries, there are animals living in the bushes. He assures me that the environmental impact assessment still being carried out will tell him what he can and cannot do. I must show you a special tree, I then say. Walking towards the beloved wild gardenia on the edge of his property. Please do not cut this one down, I plead. I'm sure it is protected. I do not say it is my protector, a guardian tree. I dare not explain how I seek it out when I feel down, how I wrap my arms around its lithe but sturdy trunk. I do not tell him I have shed many tears beneath those leaves, caressed the grainy pods of its fruits that hold many seeds delighted in the scent of white flowers so rarely seen. Instead, as I touch the cool bark, I say to him, this is a gardenia thunbergia. The Kosa call it umkangazi. Its seed can only be dispersed by elephant and rhino. I do not tell him the Afrikaans name, Buffelsbal as it strikes me suddenly that a tree with a name like that really does know how to look after itself. Mongoose. Carrying a bucket of wet washing, I stumble through untrimmed bushes of lavender and look sideways as a movement catches my eye. Mongoose scratching on a fallen tree branch. For long seconds we eye one another, not cautiously, just inquisitively, as we have done before. My eyes stretch. One side, then the other. It is wash day for both of us. It's dawning. I cannot name the stars, a planet or two perhaps, in this vast pre-dawn sky, filled with roar of ocean, repetitive cries of coots and other river birds I likewise cannot name. What colour is that becoming, over there next to that sparkle? That sounds like an Egyptian goose calling. Many layered and ever-changing. Is it blue-grey slate or ephemeral indigo? Perhaps spruce, steel blue? Words just will not do. Some stars move out of sight, behind tall trees and bush while greyish clouds obliquely hide above the dark hillside, inviting the sun to rise, to bring light to a new day. 
on that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. Can we please unmute and give Carol a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Carol, thank you so much for your generous reading. I really and I thoroughly enjoyed that reading. Even even the very sad poems. <laughs> I don't even think <laughs> The disclaimer was necessary. That was I, I thought people would leave by then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to open the room for questions. If there are any questions that you'd like to ask Carol, now is the time. Do so now, forever hold your peace. While you guys are still thinking, um, I'd like to note that Snod was one of my favorites out of the poem that you read, out of the poems that you read. And I just have a question about my people and the poem I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, they sort of use these refrains. Do you find it useful when you are writing to use refrains like that? Do they make the writing process uh, more um accessible easier palatable i i do think so in fact um the one i remember we've used as a a writing prompt in creative writing classes and um it's interesting to see what comes out of that and as a refrain um just as an exercise for people to write and yeah it is it is very helpful and the the repetition and the sound is itself is is poetic so yeah it's it's useful yeah it does it does remind me i was i was wondering the entire time why it sounded so familiar it does remind me of my own creative writing classes from yeah. when i did creative writing <laughs> okay yeah are there any other questions in the room oh Hi, Marika. Please do go Hi. ahead. Hi. I um, I'm it's not so much a question. I just want to say that I kind I, I kind of appreciate the way that you do something about the details of noticing the natural world and something about a personal experience and a reaction that you combine quite nicely together with a sense of repetition and a bit like an, if you if you do that consciously. Mm. If I uh, so if I do it consciously, um, I don't know. I I, I think with with my writing, um, it's it's kind of a, a a reaction to something I've seen or heard or or witnessed. So um, it it just it helps me to to write it down as a as a i suppose as a a way of um acknowledging the world around me i don't know if that's that's answering your question i don't know if it's a conscious thing or if it's um an automatic thing um just a reaction um i don't know if that's what you were asking um I don't know. I think it's a bit about how we quite often tend to think, oh, are we kind of poets who respond to like what you see and observe in the world and what you see and observe in yourself. And I know it's always a combination of the two, but um, I just felt in some way that you there is some way of that you work with both these aspects. So, oh, as I said, it was not so much a question, it's just more a kind of a comment that mm. that is what I appreciate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the room? Any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, Ed, please go ahead. Ed, and there's someone else. Ed, then Jacques. Thanks, Londo. I... Carol, I, I found that very moving, very moving reading. And I, I've i always liked your views of imagery and your very direct writing style. Um, 
yeah it I, I don't have a if i have a question it's about the home for these poems but i i particularly liked i think i also liked the poem i think the snare um that one and swells um and i loved the poem about the neighbor because it it also said so much about you and where you're coming from uh, as a kind of guardian of the natural world almost that or, yeah just something like that um yeah so so those are just some observations comments um will there be a home in the world for these poems um oh thank you well thank you for your your comments first of all <clears throat> and yes i hope so i am putting together a collection <clears throat> Um, so hopefully I will find an outlet for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ed. Jacques, the floor is yours. Carol, can you can you hear and see me? We can hear. I can you. hear you and see your name and now it. <laughs> see. Okay. Um. I. I loved your reading, and I. I particularly, I was particularly moved by that poem where your father is an absence, but he's so present in that poem where you, you know, you turn on the kettle and you, you're talking to him. Um, I wondered, while you were writing these poems, I mean, they, a lot of them seem to come from from a particular time, sort of a dark time, hinging into a slightly easier time. Were there were there any any poets that you liked reading at that point? Were you do you find does poetry help you in dark times or not particularly? I and mean, there obviously isn't a right answer. And are there poems, are there poets that you like to read? when you're sad? Most definitely, Jacques, and, and that's a very uh, useful question. Um, I found that poetry was was very helpful uh, in, in my own recovery um, in hospital. Um, I tried to read novels, but they were too long, and poetry is a lot shorter and easier to hold um, one's concentration. But I find it also very helpful poets. I was reading a lot, um, Mary Oliver being obvious one, um, Ada Limon as well, mm -hmm. uh, Louise Glick, um, and then this uh, the the person I quoted at the beginning, uh, Jim Harrison, very much uh, landscape and nature and that kind of thing. And I do find that that poetry helps in 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 those dark times because it's well it's comforting i find even even if it's somebody who's having a similar experience maybe or, or something that you can relate to or understand so yeah it um, means, it, means that you're not alone yeah definitely yeah thank you hmm. All right thank you jacques if there are no other questions or comments, we will uh, stop there. And thank you, Carol. Can we please? Oh, Ed, go ahead. <laughs> I, I I don't want to uh, sort of hog the space, but I I think possibly what I was trying to say earlier is that um, the style of writing there's there's a lot going on there because the 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 details the 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 minutia in some cases, just those details create something memorable. Um, they lead to an insight or perception or several insights. But um yeah, it 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 it's for me there's a there's a cumulative force, something that happens through that very precise observation. Um yeah, uh, there's a layering that happens. Um and I also really loved the, the Red Earth poem. Mm. That's a great poem. Thank you. Hey. Thanks, Ed. Amy, Amy, the floor is yours. 
Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, so that's my mom. And I, this is more of just a comment <laughs> of pride. Um, I'm tuning in from Finland. So it's really nice to be able to be here, especially being in some of the poems. Um, and I just want to say it's, I'm so proud of you, mom. You write so beautifully. And it's so nice to have granny and grandpa immortalized in this way in poetry and like as a memory and even the poem about Geraldine. It was all, it was so close to home for me, obviously, but um, it's just so beautiful that you, you're you recording all of this and also with your healing journey that you're on, that it's, that it's helping with that as well. So, yeah. And she reads beautifully. And you read beautifully. And um, some of the residents here, I'm at an artist residency and we were tuning in and loving it. So this is Sean. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you so much, Amy. And, and your fellow colleagues over there. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Amy. Are there any other? Oh, Silky, the floor is yours. You are muted. Sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I don't know if I should go on the video because my bandwidth is terribly low so it's cutting out a bit so That's okay okay no i just wanted to say thank you carol that was beautifully delivered very 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 wonderful delivery of very wonderful poems and concerning the minutiae the details that ed mentioned um that struck me rather because i've felt, especially in the very last poem that you read, a deliberateness, you know, they're not accidental minutiae, they're not accidental details, they are select details that are aware of the, well, the synchronicity, to use a commonly used term, but yeah, the non-accidental nature of the happenings of the events of the details and in the last poem especially what struck me was the the speech of the gardenia is it the gardenia that you do not convey to the neighbor mm. but which is very present in the poem and that's, you know, it, it comes to a head in that particular poem, but it simmers in the others, where the non-accident, the non-accidentalness of details, plus the very deliberate moments in which the natural world comes into being noticed, that's that struck me very much about your poems and it's something that as you can imagine pleases me greatly <laughs> so thank you for all that yeah oh, and it's it's something that i feel is almost a, a part of a, a of of an of an ongoing um a, a, a increasing awareness in our human species mm. I hope mm. yeah and that your poems are part of that tide so thank mm. you thank you Silke yeah I think yeah. that's that's um it's it's good for people to acknowledge uh, um the beauty in the world as well as as the difficulty and and I think that through poetry we can do that so yeah thank you thank you so much everybody are there any lasting questions comments if there are no comments questions um i'd like to give carol one last round of applause unmute everybody and just give carol one last embrace Yay! virtual embrace Thank you so much, everyone.
So we'll take a five minute comfort break and come back for the open mic six section session. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll be back in five minutes and that will be at 20, at least South African time, 2023. So comfort break. Thank wow. you. Meeting information system has sub menu. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-